Hello, my name is James Wenzel. Welcome to reInvent 2020. And I'm here to talk to you about building with AWS PrivateLink, Gateway Load Balancer, and AWS Partners. I am a senior uh, solutions architect, networking specialist, working with partners in the networking segment. Today's agenda, we'll be covering the building blocks to help build our conversation for today. We'll be talking about ENIs. We'll be talking about Gateway Load Balancer, which was just recently released, as well as AWS Private Link. And then we'll put it all together, looking at a functional architecture so that we can see how this works in the real world. Our desired outcomes for this session are for you to have a secure network to protect yourself and your customers. This will show you how to connect to your workloads, how to connect your workloads to your providers, how to connect your workloads to your customers, and to secure your network protecting you and your customers. Let's start off with the building blocks. This slide should be pretty familiar with, uh, for you. This shows the basic web application, three-tiered web app. We have the internet, we have an ELB, and we have our instances behind. Also at the top, we have AWS public services, sometimes referred to as services in the public cloud versus in the private cloud of a VPC. We have S3, Amazon DynamoDB, as well as Lambda, and many more. Also to note that the Elastic Load Balancer has two external IP addresses, anything that you can figure out that would actually be on the internet. So let's take a look at putting our VPCs together. So Transit Gateway is something that we released a while ago. If we have our internet coming in to a front end, right, and then we also had our DB layer, and then add on our AP layer because our application, let's say, is larger than what would fit in a standard VPC, we'd want to connect them together, and Transit Gateway is a natural way of doing that. This will allow our packets to flow and information to carry as if everything was local on a local network that we built in our own data centers. To gain access to this, we would want to add our on-premises. This could be either a VPC or it could be Direct Connect. The one thing to note is that within this structure, all of the local routing tables for each VPC would be what we consider the monarch. It would be the first authority for your instances and your workloads to see and to go to for this application. Now, one thing to note to make things easier for us is that our API and DB layer are defaulting all of their routes to the transit gateway. That allows the transit gateway to make decisions for us so that we don't have to configure each VPC every time we add something new. Every one of our transit gateway interconnect links has an ID. That ID actually allows us to build a routing table. That routing table is where we'd want to centrally manage our routing infrastructure to allow intercommunications for all of our workloads. Another thing that we introduced last year was ingress routing. The cool thing about ingress routing is it captures packets as they come in from the internet and go to where we want them to go to based on their destination. So in this example, let's say we have two firewalls. We purchase the firewalls off of the marketplace, either AMIs, and we put them in place to secure our workload. Sometimes firewalls are needed over something like an NACL or a security group because they just simply have more features or they have reporting. There's, a, there's many reasons why we'd want to get a firewall. But there are problems with this architecture. We could have a failure. Now, we want to make sure that when you get a firewall, that they're HA, or highly available, and they have some way of recovering, such as this one does here. But the issue with some of this architecture, especially if you have these, both of these firewalls in place, is that if one firewall is representing one of your AZs or subnets, and it fails, it can essentially take out the entire half of that AZ. Now your customers and you are operating at half capacity. Luckily, we have a way around this. Now, before we get into any more architectures, I need to talk to you about a basic building block that will help us with that, and those are ENI-based services. Now, ENI stands for Elastic Network Interface, and we're going to talk specifically about Gateway Load Balancer and AWS Private Link. AWS Private Link and Gateway Load Balancer both use hyperplane-based ENIs or Elastic Network Interfaces. The way this works is that we have physical machines that are distributed all over the world and all of our regions in every one of our AZs. 
All of the physicalness, or everything from the frames in layer two, is handled for you. We then encapsulate everything on the VPC level with our hyperplane. You can think of hyperplane as a construct that enables a large scale or scalable and secure communications pattern for anything in AWS. Your packets will ride on top of that encapsulation instead of having to deal with anything on the physical realm. What this means is, is that you can have up to 40 gigabits throughput speed for every ENI you put in place. They're also redundant and scalable, as I mentioned, because they are software defined. The other thing to make note is that the hyperplane based ENIs only need to know about flows. Remember, they're on top of the VPC infrastructure, not on layer two. So because of the fact that they only need to deal with flows, the transactional state decisions are anywhere around tens of microseconds. Let's dig in a little bit with the Gateway Load Balancer. I'm going to give you some of the features of what the Gateway Load Balancer offers you, and then we're going to slide that into our architecture to figure out that problem when we have one failure of a firewall. So the Gateway Load Balancer has at least eight things that we can talk about. So it allows you to access VPCs and or access appliances in another VPC. This is pretty cool because it allows other companies, if you're a partner, you can offer your offerings, or if you're a customer, you don't have to deal with the architecture of having those firewalls and firewall fleets in your workloads. The only thing you'd need to deal with is the ENI. Everything remains on the AWS backbone, and we'll talk about the backbone in a little bit in some of our slides. But one of the cool features that Gateway Load Balancer allows you to do is it allows you to auto scale. In our previous example, where you saw the failure in one AZ being taken out, there was no auto scaling possible in that scenario. That's because they don't maintain flows, which the Gateway Load Balancer does. And it will allow you to grow and shrink your inspection fleet or your firewall fleet at will. Also, this is mutually initiated. What that means is, is that the participating Gateway Load Balancer VPC and your local VPC, even between accounts, need to have some form of authorization. If you have a service provider that's using Gateway Load Balancer and a fleet of firewalls behind it, and they offer you that service, you as a customer need to accept. And if you are actually a provider and you want to offer it to your customers, nobody can come in and just start using your service once it's offered. You still need to have that mutual authentication. This also allows you to satisfy security because we don't go on the internet, we stay on the backbone, and all of these ENIs or elastic network interfaces that are used for Gateway Load Balancer can have a security group wrapped around it. It also adds an agility because again, you're only dealing with the ENIs. You're not dealing with the entire workload every time you wanna have something secured by the service behind Gateway Load Balancer. And so it also reduces costs. And I've already mentioned that it maintains the flows, allowing the, the fleet of firewalls or IDPs to grow and shrink as your business demands. So let's take a look at what this would look like. So we have our internet and we have our ELB. Everything is working fine. We want to add on to our gateway load balancer in another VPC. You'll see that we have two different availability zones. Each availability zone in this instance are using firewalls. We then place our ENIs in the picture. So now when we have our traffic flows coming in from our routing tables for our ingress routing, we would know the path that the packets will need to take. So as we start the conversation, the customer goes ahead and initiates traffic. The traffic comes in through our internet gateway. Our ingress routing says, go to the gateway load balancer endpoints. Those endpoints take that packet, send it off to the gateway load balancer, the packets then get encapsulated by a Geneve uh, protocol, preserving everything inside. The packet then goes and gets inspected. It either gets dropped or accepted or even logged, whatever it is that you want those devices to do. And then it goes on to its ELB and then to uh, ultimately the instances, giving the customers what they want. The neat thing about this is, and I'll rehash this again when we get further into it, is that neither the customer or the destination, source or destination, know that the packet was inspected again, using Geneve. You can also, again, have this set up so that one side is a customer account and the other side is a SaaS provider. So you can look at this in two ways. One way is that you would configure this and you would have one gateway load balancer VPC inspecting your packets and you can have multiple VPCs throughout your accounts taking advantage of this. 
Or if you want to offload this, you can go to a partner or become a partner and offer the service. And then the only thing the customer has to deal with is the gateway load balancer endpoints and figuring out what they want the provider to inspect for them. There's one caveat to this though. Does not support TLS termination for inspection of the firewalls. So let's say you have a scenario where you're using a SaaS service and you are TLS encrypting your packets. If you want full deep packet inspection or firewalling, you need to make sure that you handle some form of termination before the packets get to those endpoints. We can simply do this by adding in something like a NLB. So we'll change our, our ingress routing, we'll add our NLB, our pathing is still the same, but our NLB, or network load balancer, can handle the TLS termination. Now when the packets flow, they go through the NLB, TLS is terminated, then the packets flow to the gateway load balancer, and then the firewalls or IDP can fully inspect the payload of the packets, and everything moves on as the way it would be. So let's see how this Geneve works and how and why we chose it for Gateway Load Balancer. So if I walk you through the steps, we notice here that our source instance, if it doesn't know anything or if it doesn't know where the packets go, its default route is defaulting to the Gateway Load Balancer endpoint. The Gateway Load Balancer endpoint has the same type of default behavior, but out through the Internet Gateway. Now notice that the Gateway Load Balancer endpoint is also connected to the Gateway Load Balancer. That's where the encapsulation happens. So the source and destination are known, and the payload is preserved. Once it goes through the gateway load balancer endpoint, it gets encapsulated entirely by Geneve. Geneve then will have its own header put on top. The firewalls behind that need to know how to strip the Geneve header off and then place the Geneve header back on when it's done with whatever it's doing with the packet either inspecting it, allow, deny, taking statistics or measures. And then after all that's done, it goes back out to the internet, to the destination. Now, one thing to note here is as the packets are traveling through, you'll notice that the source and the destination of the packets from both the initiator as well as the customer still look the same. Everything is preserved. So they never know that the packets actually went through any form of inspection. And on down below the gateway load balancer, you'll notice that it's being encapsulated. That's why I have the purple on the outside of the blue packets um, and to be processed. Let's take a little look at a gateway load balancer packet. I know there's a lot here and this could be fr frozen or you can come back later and look at the slides or look at the recording. But two key elements here is the ID for Geneve for the VPC ID as well as the connection ID. What this allows to have happen is, if you're a provider, you can have multiple customers on the same IP address as your gateway load balancer and your fleet behind. And if you're using this internally, same thing. So you don't have to worry about IP overlap because the way the transactions happen is they happen through those IDs rather than CIDR blocks. So let's now add the gateway load balancer to our current infrastructure. So we'll go back to our three-tier web app that's connected to our on-prem through our transit gateway, and we have our communications flowing just fine. Now we want to add inspection. All the packets that are encapsulated in red are the ones that need to be inspected, and they go to a transit gateway endpoint into the VPC that has the gateway load balancer, and then therefore the gateway load balancer can then take those packets, decrypt and encrypt, and send it back. Now remember, our building blocks, the transit gateway has the routing table that can direct all of these flows because our API layer and our DB layer and our front end for anything for our workloads is defaulting to the transit gateway. This will simplify adding and moving and changing things in the future. The other thing too to note is that this, this particular VPC for the gateway load balancer does not necessarily have to be in your account. And you can also further separate it by going through a chained VPC with the endpoints and then have that be actually handled for you completely by a provider. Let's take a look at some of the partners that are already launched for this. So if you want to take advantage of this for security, for uh, orchestration, for system integration or analytics, here are some of the partners that have already integrated with Gateway Load Balancer that you can choose from. As you can see, there's some pretty big names here that you can actually take a look at and you can find in our marketplace. So that was Gateway Load Balancer, one of our endpoint services that are really kind of tiered for partners uh, to take advantage of to offer you services or to offer a mechanism or a vehicle for our partners to offer services. Another one 
is AWS Private Link. Now, Private Link has been around for a while, and Gateway Load Balancer, along with its endpoint services, is loose of thing that Private Link can do. So as we take a look at Private Link and a lot of its benefits and features, you'll notice that some of them are the same. Agility, reducing cost. You also have remains on the AWS backbone. And again, I will get back to that one. I will talk to you about that. As well as accessing PC. A couple of differences, though, is the unidirectional communication. One of the ways that this service allows you to secure your workloads is that if you're offering or partaking in a service that is being offered by private link, the communications can only be initiated by the customer. So unidirectional stateful flows, kind of like our security groups. If the customer initiates communication through the Elastic Network Interface that's attached to the private link service that goes out to the provider's account, the provider's account then does whatever it is you want it to do to the packets, and then it knows and is allowed to return that traffic. But at no time can the provider reach into the customer account. There's no mechanism for it. It's still mutually authenticated, so if you are a provider and you're offering the service, customers actually have to be authorized to turn it on. And yes, customers, you also have to authorize that service to be able to be connected to your Elastic Network interfaces. No, at no time do you need an internet gateway, and this also enables hybrid cloud. Because we're using Network Load Balancer as one of the key pieces of this design, the Network Load Balancer can use IP addresses as its targets. And IP addresses, as long as they're routable through, say, something like a VPN or Direct Connect, can actually be advertised to the cloud. This can really help out if you need to do one or two things. One thing could be is if you don't have a large cloud presence, but you want to take advantage of a service that's offered on AWS, you can get a small VPC, which we'll show in a future architecture, and consume that service. Consequently, if you're a provider and you have something on-premises that cannot be shared or cannot be replicated in the cloud, you can still present that in the cloud in the same similar manner. Now, one thing to take note is that with Private Link, there's two different types of endpoints for endpoint services. One type that we like to call gateway services actually manipulates your routing table. So if you were to put an endpoint into your VPC to say gain access to Amazon S3 or DynamoDB, you'll have to do nothing else but simply turn that on. Once you turn that on, all of your communications will cease to go through an internet gateway, which you don't see in this diagram, and go straight through the AWS backbone. This will also save you from some egress charges, as well as a bit more secure. You can also set a policy on your S3 bucket, as well as setting up policies on the endpoints, saying who can go where and why, so you can have that extra layer of security. The other type, which is what we already talked about with the Elastic, or the elastic Network Interfaces for the Gateway Load Balancer, is the interface type. This is the one that puts an IP address inside your local subnet. So once again, with Private Link, you can have IP overlap. It is totally fine because it's using the IDs of the VPC for its communications as opposed to using the IP addresses for natural routing. So all communications to these services, the ones that I'm highlighting here, SNS, SQS, and Lambda, or it could be anything that's being offered by a partner, needs to be routed through that network interface. So the routes in the routing table will need to be placed by you. Here's just a small amount of services that we offer. As of today, we launched uh, 92 services uh, since 20, uh, October 2020, and we're onboarding more and more services as we go along. If there is a service that you don't see within this list or on the list that you can look at online, you can simply ask your account team to take a look at where in the list or add a PFR or some sort of feature request for a new service to be added. This is commonly done all the time. Remember, 95% of our services are not made because we thought it was cool. We made those services because you needed them. You asked us to make them. So let's take a look at what private link looks like in, a, in an architecture. So in this architecture, we have our consumer account and our provider account. Now, they can be the same company. It doesn't have to be two different companies. But also, our provider could be a partner of ours. Um, or you could be the partner providing a service. And then the consumer account could be the customers or yourself.
You'll notice that the Elastic Network interfaces are in each of the AZs for this particular service. We want to make sure that when you're offering a service through Private Link, that you take advantage of as many availability zones or AZs as you can with a multi-AZ network load balancer, which is shown on the left. The reason why you do this is if you do not have a presence in that AZ, your customer will not be able to consume that service in their AZ. And this can actually result in some cross AZ charges. So to make things easier for yourself, if you're in a particular region that has multiple AZs, more than three, it's a good idea to spread your workload out into every AZ that's there. And as I mentioned before, communications are initiated by our customer. They go through the ENI, or Elastic Network Interface, across the AWS backbone, through our network load balancer, and to our individual instances. It is a unidirectional flow. Now I mentioned that also hybrid works. One of the examples that I have here is that we have a direct connector of VPN from on-prem and they want to consume something in the cloud. Let's say that there's a, a service out there that's only available on AWS cloud and is not available for on-prem. All the customer has to do is simply create an account in AWS, create a VPC within that same region, and then in that VPC attach their direct connector VPN, and then create their elastic network interface, connecting it to the provider's uh, services or workload. And then from there, as long as that elastic network interface is routable to their on-premises, all the security groups, their on-prem routers are allowing this to happen, traffic can simply flow and they can consume that service. Now, a couple of things to note if you're a provider or if you're working on where the packets are coming from is where do I get the source IP address? Because of the fact that you can be multi-tenant and because of the fact that you can have cross-sider addresses, you need to have a way of figuring out where these things are coming from. And the way we can do that is by enabling the proxy protocol version 2 in the target group. And I've given a list of examples or an example here. Again, this will be recorded so you can go back, um, and there's plenty of blogs on this, of how you can actually enable it. Once you enable it, it's enabled for the entire target group. The one thing I would like to note about proxy protocol version 2, though, is that it is an additive. So when you have a packet that's traversing, say, the internet or multiple workloads, it may gain and lose headers along the way, depending on what it passes through. So proxy uh, PPV2 does not rip and replace what's there in the header. It's actually added in the header on top of. So a way to get to that is we need to understand what is inside the header and what we want to key on. So luckily for you, we have a uh, small library that we call ProProd in GitHub, and I have the link here, um, that's a small JavaScript that will actually key out so that you can see the VPC ID of where those Elastic Network interfaces are actually positioned. This is going to allow you to consume that service and know where things are coming from. So if you have one service as a partner uh, and you're providing it to multiple AWS customers, you'll know where things are being consumed from. So as I promised, I said I was going to talk about the AWS Backbone. Now, many of you may have seen this slide before, and this slide will show you the fiber that we have, but it's probably out of date, especially after Andy Jassy. He was mentioning that about adding more and more of our local zones and our wavelength zones. So unfortunately, this may be a little out of date, but it still shows what I want to talk about. All of these pieces of fiber that go across the Atlantic, the Pacific, um, across continents, are owned by AWS. We actually maintain, own, and operate undersea cable. We maintain, own, and operate transcontinental cable. We own all of the POPs, and we control all the egress and ingress to the internet to this backbone. That's pretty important because we can tell with all of these pieces of fiber where traffic is going, we know if there's a break in the line, we know how our latency is, and we can also do really fast rerouting. So we can guarantee sub 10 millisecond transfer rates from one region to another. Now, if you introduce other things on top of this, like the speed of your EC2 instances, or how fast things can flow through a VPC, that will slow things down, of course. But this is a dual 100 gigabit network that we have many dark fiber strands on to allow us to continually provide service for our customers. Should there be an outage, we can reduce or completely eliminate any feeling or any uh, uh, issues that our customers can have. Also, to note, we are always, always working on this backbone. So now that we have a global backbone, it doesn't mean, as I've mentioned before, that we're going to stop. We're always going to make it better. We're going to make it bigger, and we're going to continue 
Another thing let's talk about is now that we've created these services with Private Link and we created these services with Gateway Load Balancer, how are they consumed? Or where can I, as a customer, go and find them to actually add them to my infrastructure? This introduces the AWS Marketplace. So the AWS Marketplace is, is some place that you can think of like an application store. You can go there, read about different services that are offered. They're even rated by other customers on how well they're liked. You can also see that all of our services are curated by SAs or solution architects to make sure that they're scalable, they don't cost our customers too much money, that they're secure, and they're what we like to call well-architected. Now, if you're a provider, this is also a place that you can put your architectures or put your workloads so that they're easily found and identified by customers. Again, there's no public IP addresses whatsoever in this scenario, and it's really easy to consume it, especially when you're using endpoint services. You simply go down, click on the endpoint service that you want, you would agree to whatever the terms and services are, it may kick off a CloudFormation script, and that's about it. Usually within the CloudFormation script is all your configuration, and then the endpoint appears, and then away you go. So let's put it all together and add our private link to our original architecture that we have. So here we are. Our architecture is working along. We are being inspected by Gateway Load Balancer. And now we need to consume a specific service. Maybe we need to send something out to be uh, configured or needed to be some data that we need to retrieve. We would simply set up our endpoint, and we would search for the network load balancer's service from our provider, and traffic can flow. Now, one thing that's important to note is just like with these ENIs, uh, with the gateway load balancer, as long as you have routing rules applying, you can actually have your DB layer consume this service if you want to as well. Or you can also put in ENI in every single VPC and consume it that way. It really comes down to how you want your traffic to flow, if you need to do any restrictions, and the way the provider set up its infrastructure. So another thing I want to talk about, now that we're talking about networking constructs, is that we need to really look at networking more as infrastructure as code. Remember that when you're working with a database or working with an EC2 instance or something like that, if you have a failure, it could have some implications, but it's usually contained within the application that those things are serving. If you have a problem with your network, it usually will have a, an impact on everything that you're dealing with. So we strongly encourage you as you're building these things to use something like CloudFormation or Terraform or even scripts so that you can rapidly work on automation. So if you have to go ahead and move and create services over and over and over again, multiple regions or whatever it is, you can simply execute the code with some minor changes. The other that will allow you to actually have some rapid rollout. But the other thing that it allows you to do is it allows you to troubleshoot. If you had any ads, moves, or changes, and especially in the networking world, you can make a change and not feel a problem until a couple of days later. So a good thing to do is to have these things checked into, say, a Git repo, um, and that will also allow you to put some code control on this. But more importantly, if there's a problem that you find later, you can dump your current configuration and compare it to what you've actually released. Looking at the differences between this, you can see what was changed. Now, also, you can look in your logs, and you can also look in CloudTrail. But this will help you resolve or recover much quicker. So again, you want to make sure that you use infrastructure as code, setting these things up. If you are a partner or a potential partner, definitely look at endpoint services. This is something that will really help you out, um, making things easier for your customers. And if you're a customer and you don't want to have to maintain or create these ancillary things such as uh, security or security as a service, or you want to consume something, an endpoint service is actually the way to go because it makes it much easier for you to actually consume, use, and architect around. Thank you very much for attending my session. Another thing I'd like to mention is we have a Twitch session that goes on, um, and I have the link below my name, networkingandcontentdelivery.splashthat.com, which is basically an AWS Twitch channel. On that channel, we'll be discussing things that happen on and at reInvent, as well as continually discussing new networking items as we go along in a live question and answer format. And then lastly, please fill out the survey. We like to do these things and we love talking to our customers, but we also love hearing from our customers. Remember that comment I mentioned about 95% of our services coming from you? Well, this is how we learn about it. And also, this is how I learn how to do these things better. Thank you and enjoy the rest of reInvent.